please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back. You're watching India Business Hour Plus. Now let's get to you the big international development overnight. U.S. President Donald Trump has announced that the United States will withdraw from the nuclear deal stitched together with Iran in 2015. Here's a special report on what this means. The fact is this was a horrible one-sided deal that should have never, ever been made. It didn't bring calm. It didn't bring peace. And it never will. In the years since the deal was reached, Iran's military budget has grown by almost 40 percent, while its economy is doing very badly. After the sanctions were lifted, the dictatorship used its new funds to build nuclear-capable missiles, support terrorism, and cause havoc throughout the Middle East and beyond. Now, former U.S. President Barack Obama has criticized Donald Trump's decision to exit from the Iran nuclear deal. Remember, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, was negotiated and implemented during Obama's presidency. Now, in a statement of nearly 1,000 words, Obama says that the deal with Iran is working and that the view is shared by European allies and dependent experts as well as the current U.S. Defense Secretary. To put the deal at risk without any violation on Iran's part is a serious mistake, Barack Obama says. The deal was an agreement not just between Iran and the U.S., but along with U.K., France, Germany, China and Russia. As part of the deal, Iran has destroyed a reactor core over 13,000 centrifuges and eliminated 97% of its enriched uranium stockpile. Obama asked that without the nuclear deal, the United States could be left with a losing choice between a nuclear-armed Iran or another war in the Middle East. And as anticipated, crude oil prices surged after Trump made the crucial announcement that both Brent and WTI crude soared within moments of his statements and now are trading with nearly gains of about 2.8%. Brent at a $76.9 per barrel market was at 77 but yeah, it's recovered a little. It, it's slowed down a little bit. NYMEX at 71 per dollar per barrel mark. Now, that's... Remember the highest since November 2014. Trade sanctions, if you remember, on Iran could disrupt global oil supplies, sending prices much higher. And that is something that we will be watching very closely. But another big global development two days after holding a second unscheduled meeting with Xi Jinping, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has released three American detainees. The move is seen as a goodwill gesture ahead of the scheduled meeting between the leaders of the two countries. President Trump has made this announcement on Twitter saying that the three hostages held in North Korea are currently on their way to the United States. He also said that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo had a good lengthy conversation with Kim Jong-un and that a date and time for the summit has been set. Now, as Karnataka gears up to the vote on the 12th of May back home, a controversy has erupted over the seizure of thousands of voter identity cards from a flat in Bengaluru. Both the Bharatiya Janata Party as well as the Congress have accused each other of being involved in this hoarding of voter IDs in the Raja Rajeshwari Nagar constituency. Senior Congress leader Anand Sharma accused the BJP of trying to subvert free and fair elections. Addressing a rally in Belgavi, Prime Minister Modi asked the voters to be cautious, adding that the Congress can stoop to any level. तो हमने चुनाव आयोग को ये सारी बातें बताई हैं कि भारतीय जनता पार्टी केंद्र की एजेंसीज इनकम टैक्स का महकमा इन सब का दुरुपयोग हो रहा है भारतीय जनता पार्टी इस चुनाव में हर वो हथकंडा अपना रही है जिससे एक स्वस्थ रूप में एक सही निष्पक्ष चुनाव ना हो पाए now, staying with Karnataka, it's a battle of big wigs in Badami. Chief Minister Siddharamaya and BJP leader B. Sriramulu are vying for this very seat. CNBC TV team's Ashna Shukla travelled to the constituency to speak to the voters and get a sense of their concerns and expectations. <laughs>
political capital of the Chalukya dynasty and a very prominent historical and a protected site here in Karnataka. Tourism being the largest economy driver of this region, but has the successive governments been able to draw the true potential of this place or has it largely been neglected only for political gains? We met Raju at the famous cave temples. He has been a tourist guide in Badami for 25 years, but survival now is difficult. Tourist football is very low, and after that, its advertisement is very low. Karnataka people don't know where Badami is from. In that way, there is no advertisement or anything. So, that's why there is no development of tourism. One guide can go to tourism here. There are no tourists here. So, there are no tourists here. So, at least, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. So, after that, you have to go to tourism. With no other employment opportunities, the town of Badami is dependent on tourism for its livelihood. However, despite central programs like Hridhya, Heritage City Development and Augmentation Yojana to preserve 12 heritage cities, including Badami, not much has changed here. In July 2017, data submitted in the Lok Sabha says that of the 19 crore rupee fund sanctioned for Badami, only 4 crore rupees was released and even that remains unutilized. But then Badami caught the political attention. The battle of the heavyweights has brought hope to this town. वो शिद्रा में भी वो लिंगायत का अनुयायी है, बसोता तो का अनुयायी है, सभी लिंगायत लोग कांग्रेस को हेल्प करता है। कांग्रेस को हेल्प करता है, कांग्रेस को होट डालता है। हमें सुधा में वो यार हम लोग जो जीते हमारा खेत को करे और इसको रिजन ना किया या और जो काम करेगा हम उनको और देंगे। इस साल क्या हुआ मैडम? जो सिद्रा माया सर और रामूलो सर वो खड़ा हो रहे हैं। अभी बदामी का देखो मैडम पूरा इंडिया में फेमस हो गया � आजकल के बच्चे हमारे कहीं दूर जाने की जरूरत नहीं है मैडम। वो अन्ना बाग गया दिया और खिरे बाग गया दिया बहुत सारे बाग गया दिया वो तो बहुत गरीब गरीब आदमी गरीब 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 लोगों को बहुत मदद किया शिद्रा माया ने। a lot of expectations riding on these high-profile candidates from the voters here in Badami. And the hope is that with this newfound fame, this small, sleepy town will actually get to ride the train for development. With camera person Gopi Subhaya, this is Achna Shukla here in Badami. Okay, let's take a very short break on that note. Up next, the 15 Finance Commission sets up a six-member council. What will it do? We will tell you the details on the other side. Welcome back. Now, the big headline from the insolvency space, JP Infratech's fate hangs in the balance. Sources say that the company's creditors have rejected the resolution plan submitted by Lakshwadeep. Ritu Singh is here with exclusive details. Ritu, you know, when the highest bidder is rejected, what really happens next? JP Infratech's case has been a complicated one from the word go and now the company's fate hangs in the balance as we understand from sources that the lenders have rejected the sole resolution plan that was on the table for JP Infratech. That was from Lakshwadeep, which is a joint venture between Suraksha, ARC and Dosti Realty. We understand from sources that as many, many as 85.7% of the lenders voted against this resolution plan, which we understand was close to 73.50 crore rupees, of which about 4,000 crore rupees was for the land bank, about 1,200 for uh, cash repayment and the remaining for long-term NCDs and some equity to the lenders. But this offer, we understand from sources, was not acceptable to the lenders as they felt that this offer undervalued the company. Do remember uh, that the liquidation value of the company is close to 12 to 14,000 crore rupees and the debt of the company is approximately 10,000 crore rupees. So the lenders were hoping uh, for a lower haircut than this as well. So what is next for the company now? Well, uh, you know, if it is to be liquidated, liquidated or not or whether a fresh round has to be uh, called for that call is yet to be taken but the final say will rest with the supreme court so that is where the case uh, that is back where the case will head uh, for now no resolution on the table for jp infotech 
Okay, so that hits a dead end once again. We'll have to watch this place very closely to see what happens. But there's more on uh, the stress assets space, and this is another exclusive. Sources tell us that Binani Simmons lenders have called off their meeting schedule for tomorrow. The lenders were expected to consider Ultratex revised offer. Now, the meeting has been cancelled uh, as the matter is now in Supreme Court. So, essentially, we are not going to see the COC take a decision anymore. The Supreme Court is going to be the final say in this very matter. That's, of course, something that Ritu Singh has broken. Let's move on, on to news from the Finance Ministry. The Finance Commission has set up a six-member advisory council, which will assist the commission on issues like terms of reference. Apna Das is here with your details. Apna, tell us more about the mandate that has been given to this advisory council. Well, we are given to understand that, in fact, on the, the 16th of April itself, uh, the constitution of this advisory panel had been given a go-ahead in the sense that uh, it's it's a suggestion, it's on the suggestions of the 15th Finance Commission, of course. Uh, having said that, this panel has now come into force. So it's a six-member panel. Dr. Sujit Bala uh, is a part-time member, but you have uh, Dr. Arvind Virmani, you have Sajid Chinoy, you have Neil Khan Mishra, uh, lots of other big names also as part of the panel. Well, uh, you know, uh, the point to be, of course, noted is that uh, this advisory panel has been constituted by the 15th Finance Commission uh, also after uh, the kind of observations that the southern state finance ministers have made on various uh, uh, you know, issues uh, regarding the terms of reference of the 15th Finance Commission. Hence, uh, the first point over here is the fact that any matters relating to the terms of reference, uh, well, the advisory panel can go ahead and give in their suggestions. Apart from this, of course, uh, they'll also be looking to the best practices internationally in terms of fiscal devolution and bringing in their suggestions. Uh, you know, of course, uh, no no indication or clarity or rather no signal at all from the government quarters if there will be any amendments uh, to the TOR down the line. But uh, the advisory pan panel will play some kind of a critical role in trying to kind of, you know, give further advice to the commission. Also, 15th and 17th May, the 15th Finance Commission will be doing uh, nationwide interactions with the top economists. So that's something to watch out for. Okay, Sapna, thanks for all that. That's, of course, something that we will be tracking. But for now, quick commercial break. On the other side, China's largest truck maker, Biki Photon, shelves India plans. What went wrong? We tell you on the other side. Welcome back. Now, in what could be a shortened arm for the centers making India program, China's... Uh, BYD Auto is looking to enter the Indian market and is also planning to manufacture locally. Nitya Balakrishnan has more on the plans of the Warren Buffett-backed DEV manufacturer. Nitya, what are you picking up? Looks like China definitely wants to cash in on India's electric vehicle pie. Now, a team from BYD Auto in Shenzhen had arrived in Hyderabad earlier today and categorically, we're given to understand from sources, they are keen on setting up a production unit here in the state. What we're given to understand is that the state's chief minister, KCR, has indicated that he appreciates BYD Auto's interest in setting up a production facility in Hyderabad and the state government will help facilitate the same. Now, BYD wants to enter India in a staggered manner. They will be bringing e-buses to India first, after which they want to foray with trucks, autos and even passenger vehicles. Now, in a demo bus that the Chief Minister of Telangana even wrote, uh, they indicated that a single charge takes up to three hours, but uh, 300 to 400 kilometers is the kind of distance that the e-bus can travel on just that single charge. So, BYD wants to enter the fray as far as uh, Telangana's electric vehicle policy goes. Remember, the state is still to finalize that policy. What we're given to understand, however, is that the Chief Minister has indicated 500 e-buses will be the initial tranche under phase one or which the state government will procure. Now, if BYD Auto chooses to enter this market and not just that make in India, remember, it will change the game and be very interesting as far as the EV story here goes because you're talking about homegrown M&M and Tata Motors who are very keen on cashing in on the electric vehicle growth story here in the country. So with BYD entering the fray, looks like it will be a very exciting phase for the electrification of vehicles here in the country. Oh, absolutely, it will, Nidhir. Thanks for that. Now, meanwhile, China's largest truck maker, Biki Photon, which had earlier committed an investment of a little over 2,000 crore rupees in Maharashtra, has nixed its plans. Why? Utkash Chaturvedi is here to tell us just that. Utkash, what led to Photon pulling the plug? If you look at 2011, when this MOU was signed between uh, Biki Photon 
and the Maharashtra government, the commercial vehicle industry was at its peak. In fact, 1213, uh, they went ahead and touched highest sales ever. But it was in 2014 uh, when the industry saw slowdown, a lot of overcapacity uh, happened. And that is the time when Photon decided not to go ahead with commercial vehicle launches but to launch pickups and uh, jeeps now that is also one of their forties and in fact till last year uh, they were really thinking of going ahead they met they had met the dealers and they had they were thinking of going ahead and launching their first vehicle in 2019 but at this point of time what we are picking up is uh, that they have held any plans of investment in india in fact the land which they had bought in chakran it was a 250 acre plot which they bought in chakran in pune uh, they that is up for sale so clearly now the chinese truck maker giant pulling its plug when it comes to the indian market Okay, so one Chinese player actually betting big and one completely pulling out. That's, of course, uh, something that is going to be a bit of a disappointment. But, uh, yes, it's a bittersweet moment. But with that, we'll have to wrap up this edition of India Business Now. Well, thank you for watching. Good night.